Hola, ¿qué tal? Buenas tardes a todos. Este, hoy eh, tengo el placer, el gran placer, de presentarles a mi hermano académico, Enrique Quique Macías. Este, hermano, colaborador y amigo. Ya se está poniendo esto muy dramático. <risa> Este, les cuento un poco de aquí, que bueno, muchos de ustedes ya lo conocerán porque él es eh, un habitual de acá, él ha hecho estancias cuando era estudiante y después como colaborador ha venido varias veces a, a México, eh, tiene una hija mexicana también, eso es otra historia. Eh, Quique realizó su doctorado en 2016 en el Instituto de Astrofísica de Andalucía, en Granada, eh, dirigido por eh, Guillermo Andrade y Mar Maya Osorio, esa es la causa de que sea mi hermano académico, es mi mismo director de tesis. En 2016 eh, se fue a Boston, a la Boston University, como postdoc. Eh, bueno, eh, mencionar que su tesis de, 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 de doctorado eh, fue sobre discos protoplanetarios. Eh, después de su tesis en, en Granada, se fue a la Boston University. Estuvo de 2016 a 2019 eh, trabajando también en discos protoplanetarios con, este, ¿cómo se llamaba? Eh, eh, Catherine, eh, después en 2019 eh, fue Alma Fellow en Santiago, en Chile, eh, donde siguió trabajando en discos protoplanetarios. Y en noviembre de 2021 empezó como eh, staff astronomer en la ESO en Garching, en Alemania. Eh, trabaja para el Alma Regional Center eh, Europeo. Eh, como he mencionado, Kiki es un colaborador muy cercano mío y eh, él eh, ha hecho muchos estudios de eh, formación planetaria en discos protoplanetarios, con ALMA, con BLA, y hoy les va a contar una historia muy bonita sobre este tema. Gracias. Gracias. Um, so, uh, should I speak in English? I've prepared everything for, to do it in English, but... Como tú quieras. Okay, I'll do it in English then. Um, Gracias, yeah, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's really great pressure to, to be, well, it would be a great pressure to be there, uh, but it's a great pressure to still be there virtually. And yes, I'm going to talk to you about a um, closer look to the building blocks of planetesimals, so characterizing the, the dust content, which are the building blocks of planetesimals and planets, of protoplanetary disks. And yeah, I'm listening here, uh, most of my collaborators, uh, you can see Carlos is right up there, and you'll see also some other familiar names of people that uh, used to be there a while ago, like Osmar, Aníbal, and also Karina. And so first, let me give you some background. Um, I think most of you will probably know that uh, planets form in front of planetary disks. These are circumstellar disks of gas and dust that uh, rotate around young stellar objects. Um, but this process is actually very complex because as you can imagine, we start from dust particles are micron sizes, like in the interstellar medium. And somehow they have to grow and form things, bodies, solid bodies that are larger than the radius of the Earth. So this is a process that spans various orders of magnitude in size and also in time. So it's actually quite complex. But the basically the dust content of protoplanetary disks will set the most basic initial conditions for this planet formation to happen. Uh, in particular, the total dust mass of planetary disk will let us know about the budget that we have available to form planets, basically how many planets we can form. How this dust mass evolves with time will tell us about when planets form. Uh, how this dust mass is distributed across the disk will tell us about where planets form in the disk, and that will therefore tell us how, uh, what things about the composition of these planets and their atmospheres and so on. And then also the dust size particle distribution, together with all these other elements, will tell us about how planets form in general. Um, so how this, do these particles grow from these micron sizes in the ASM to these huge bodies? Um, we know a lot of the ingredients and all of the physical processes that go into this, into this process. Uh, we have, for example, processes involving the interaction between the dust particles and the gas. Um, the gas in front of disk will see the effects of the thermal pressure, and therefore that will affect the force balance and that will affect the dynamic, dynamics of the system. Dust particles, however, uh, once they become 
uh, big enough, they will not see the effects of this thermal pressure. So that can create basically a drag force on the gas onto the, onto the dust particles. In, this will basically result on the particles moving, tending to move towards the regions of high pressures. So in the radial direction, we have high pressures in the inner parts of the disk. So this causes what we call radial drift. But these particles that are, when they achieve sizes of about a millimeter, they will tend to move towards the inner regions of the disk. And then in the vertical direction, we have higher pressures in the midplane. So also the large particles will tend to settle into the midplane, which we will call dust settling. Uh, then we have other processes that involve the more chemical interactions uh, between the dust particles and volatiles in the disk that can freeze or sublimate on the surface of the grains, depending on uh, the temperature of the disk. And these ices freezing and sublimating can then alter also the, the physical properties like the stickiness of the grains and also can alter the optical properties of the grains. And then we have pr processes that involve the interactions between the particles themselves. The two particles collide. Uh, they can stick together and grow, what we call aggregation, form a larger particle. But if they, uh, if they shock fast enough, they can result in a destructive collision, which we call fragmentation as well. Basically, two particles destroying each other and forming smaller particles out of it instead of growing. So if you put all of these ingredients into a dust evolution model, um, these models tell you that it's, it seems to be relatively easy to form particles that are around millimeter sizes. But then we have some problems growing from there. Uh, the first one is the what, what's called the drift barrier. And this is the result of the radial, these millimeter centimeter size particles starts to suffer this radial drift. And this radial drift is so efficient that these particles will migrate too fast, actually. They will fall into the star before they can they have time to grow even further. And then even if you manage to stop these particles from drifting, then we have another barrier, which is called the fragmentation barrier, which is uh, the result of this fragmentation between particles as they grow all, uh, bigger, they're more massive. So uh, their interactions tend to result more in fragmentation. And so basically you find that you cannot form particles that are larger than one meter. And just to show an example, this is a simulation um, a dust of dust, these dust evolution models. Here on the y-axis, you have the grain size. On the x-axis, you have the radius in the disk. And then in colors, you're going to see the surface density at each particle size, basically. So if you see uh, these brighter colors higher up. This means that more of the, of the mass is located in the larger particles. So I click play. You can see that the dust growth is very, very efficiently grows until this red line, which is the fragmentation barrier. And then as time goes on, uh, the, dust, the gas surface density changes, and then real drift starts to kick in, and then your dust sizes here in at tens of AUs and 100 AUs start to be limited by this uh, radial drift. And if you leave this evolve enough, then all those particles just fall into the star. But basically, you don't form things that are larger than 10 centimeters, one meter at most. So uh, what is the solution to this? Well, the most proposed solution and most popular one is uh, involves what's uh, the so-called streaming instability. This is an instability. And pure MHC instability, there is a hydrodynamic stability actually, that results from the, these drag forces between the gas on the dust and also the back reaction of the dust particles on the gas. Um, when these dust particles start to migrate to a region of higher pressure, then this creates a sort of a positive feedback loop that also reinforces that this pressure maximum, then this tends to uh, make more particles move into this pressure maximum and so on until some turbulence dissipates that. But then you, with this instant instability, you can quickly create a clumps of self-gravitating material. And then you will have basically a planetesimal, something with bodies that are kilometer size, you can form them very quickly. So the, the scenario is more or less than what I show here in this sketch. You quick, very quickly, quickly from dust, just simple dust population, particles aggregating uh, with other particles. You can reach millimeter, centimeter size sizes, and then this flattens out, but at some point you sort of you have these conditions to trigger semi stability, and then you very quickly form things that are kilometer size, and then these kilometer size bodies can then at, um, attract other smaller bodies and other particles and grow even further. So, what are the requirements to trigger this instability? Are, do we really have these conditions? The requirements are to have millimeter centimeter size particles. Uh, the reason for this is because these are the particles that are um, more. Um, uh, sensitive to these gas drag forces. 
And then we also need to have local dust to gas mass ratios. So the abundance of dust compared to the gas needs to be close to one locally. That means in the mid plane, in the region where you want this serving instability to happen. Um, so basically what we need is we need to stop these dust particles from drifting. We need to concentrate them at some point and concentrate them with enough abundance that we see dust to gas mass ratio of one. So basically we need dust traps at gas pressure bombs, gas pressure bombs that can stop radial drift. Um, so how do we know if we see these gas pressure bombs? So for this, let me first show you this, uh, this drawing that shows the, what I was telling you about the distribution of, of the dust particles in the disk, that the larger dust particles tend to migrate inwards, and then they also try to migrate to the disk mid plane, while the smaller particles can be left in the outer disk and in the disk atmosphere. So if you observe this with a different wavelengths, you'll be seeing a different, you'll be tracing different uh, dust particles. So if you observe an infrared uh, scatter light, for example, you'll be seeing the smaller particles that are located in the disk atmosphere. If you wanna reach these millimeter, centimeter sized particles that are located in the mid plane, which is also where planets form, you need to observe at two millimeter, centimeter uh, continuum. So basically you need to go to radio, ALMA, VLA. So, if we have these dust traps at gas pressure bombs that are helping us form planetesimals, when we observe these seven millimeter centimeter uh, wavelengths, what we should see is that we should see small scales of structures in their emission. Uh, now, do we see these things? Well, do most of you imagine? Yes, we do these, see these small scales of structures. This is just a gallery of some of the most popular disks, uh, this actually updated. This is from 2020, there are even more disks now. And in fact, in here, I'm also including some scatter light observations that do show some substructures, but whether the origin is the same one or not is, is debatable. Um, but you can see that disks do show a variety of substructures, rings, gaps, cavities, spiral arms, uh, these axisymmetric vortices or, or horseshoes. Um, however, the question is, are these really dust traps? And if they are, can they trigger the same instability? Do they have these conditions that we need to have? And in order to answer these questions, what we need to measure is these two things, the dust particle size distribution to know if we have the particles that are the right size. And we need to measure the dust surface density across the disk to know if the dust particles are accumulating and if they're accumulating to the um, gas, to gas, gas to dust mass ratios that we need. So how do we do that? So what, one of the best tools to do that is using multi-wavelength observations in, in the submillimeter. Uh, the reason for this is because the spectrum of the dust thermal emission is basically gonna be a function of the dust temperature, the optical depth at the, at the frequency you're observing, and also the albedo. I put it in brackets because sometimes in some cases you can um, discard it, you can forget about the albedo. Um, they, you can then separate the optical depth in just the sub dust surface density and their, the dust opacity of that wave of frequency. So this becomes a function of temperature, density, and opacity. Now, the good thing is that if you assume some dust composition and you assume some dust particle size distribution, uh, like follow, following a power law with some slope, which is what everyone does, with just a single parameter, the maximum gray size, you can then get a dust opacity law that will give you the dust opacity and the albedo at any frequency. So then these functions becomes a function actually of just the dust temperature, dust surface density, maximum grain size, and the observing frequency. The observing frequency you know, so you have that, if you observe on multiple of wavelengths, you'll have a function that depends on three of these three parameters and you can try to determine. So this was done classically some years ago already before ALMA. Um, when it, this was done early, in the early times, uh, usually the assumption was that the emission was optically thin. And if you do this, then this becomes even simpler because the spectral index of the emission, so assuming that the emission is a power law with frequency, this alpha spectral index, will be simply two plus beta, where beta is the spectral index of the dust opacity. So how the, the assuming that the dust opacity is also power, follows a power law. So with the spectral index of your emission, then you can determine this beta, and then this beta will be a function of maximum grain size if you assume some grain composition. So by simply measuring the spectral index between two wavelengths, you can get an estimate of the maximum grain size. That sounds really easy, and this was done. And for example, in this case, uh, they measured this variation of, of beta here on the right plot with radius. 
And then they determined that the maximum grain sizes were varying between one millimeter and one centimeter in the inner teeth. So this would mean that grains are millimeter centimeter sizes, which is what we need. That's good. As you can imagine, um, the disks are not optically thin, and I will talk more about this. But first, let me go through another option to measure the disk si the grain sizes, which is the millimeter polarization observations. Um, and I'm not a polarization expert, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. But basically, the polarized signal, um, the polarized emission um, of the dust thermal emission will be has been seen that is dominated by scattering. So if it's dominated by scattering, then by measuring how the polarization fraction changes with wavelength, you can estimate the maximum grain size. And this is an example case. Uh, this is HC162986, a proprietary disk. And we, this is, these are the polarization vectors. And assume just by taking this polarization fraction, uh, you can estimate how what's the maximum grain size. And the thing is that the, max, the grain sizes that one would get from these polarization observations are actually smaller, between 100 and 200 microns. They cannot get, they cannot reproduce these with particles that are larger than millimeter centimeter, at least in the simplified way, in the simplified analysis that has been done so far. So we seem to have this conundrum. Uh, what's the dust particle size? It's two millimeter centimeter, which would allow us to form these planetesimals via streaming instability. Or do we, are they a hundred microns? Which would mean that we need another mechanism to form planetesimals. Um, as I said, the disks are not optically thin. So there, there are many caveats here. But as I said, the disks are not optically thin. If they're not optically thin, then self-scattering is really, it becomes, it starts to become important, which was neglected uh, for many years. And also, as I showed, the disks are not smooth. They have substructures, which means that the, sort of the surface density will vary across the radius. The, the particle size in principle should also vary. So high resolution is important. You, know, you need to do this analysis with high resolution in order to be able to take into account all of these effects. Um, there's another problem currently with the uh, characterization of the dust content of the disks, which is really actually the dust mass, so the bulk mass of the proprietary disks. So classically, the dust mass has been measured with just a flux, some millimeter flux. Uh, if you assume that the disk is optically, the emission is optically thin, you assume that the disk is isothermal, which is okay, more or less reasonable. Um, if you get one flux, and you also assume uh, some dust opacity, basically some composition, grain size, blah blah, you get a, you assume a number for the dust opacity. Then with this, this simple equation, you can get a dust mass out of a flux, and assuming that some temperature. So this has been done uh, with ALMA for, with many low resolution surveys of many star forming regions. And the results seem to be, when you compare them with the masses in exoplanetary systems, the results do not seem to be consist consistent. So in this plot I'm showing in, in the y-axis is the mass in either in dust or in planets. And in the x-axis is the stellar mass. So in red, I'm showing the dust mass measured in disk with this simple equation. And in blue, I'm showing more or less the masses of the exoplanets and the cores of the exoplanets or giant planets. So you can see that the mass in disks is actually, since we get actually lower than the mass in exoplanetary systems. So this doesn't make a lot of sense if these exoplanets will be formed out of these dust particles. So two proposed solutions to these are that either planetesimals are already formed by one million year, and then you, these planetesimals being so big, you don't see them a millimeter wavelengths, or that there's a late and continuous fall info of material on the disk that basically replenishes the material. So when you observe it, you see less material, but when you integrate over time, you get enough mass. However, uh, as I said, these masses are estimated with this simple equation. Uh, as I said, these, uh, the, these, the grain opacity will vary with grain size. We don't know what the grain size. So obviously we don't know what the grain size, we don't know what the opacity, but also the grain size in principle should vary with uh, radius. Um, so you cannot just assume one single value of the dust passing. The disks are not exactly thin, as I said, and I'll show you in a few minutes. And also disks are not isothermal. So all of these assumptions basically are incorrect. How much incorrect they are, we still don't know. But in order to resolve this, in order to measure this properly, what you need to do is measure this uh, in detail with high resolution and with multi-wavelength. So basically, you need a spatial result, multi-wavelength modeling 
to properly measure the dust particle size in the disk to measure the dust surface density and therefore to get an estimate of the total dust mass. So this is, a, this is the conclusion of my introduction. Uh, so now I'm going to start showing some of the results that we, I mean, we've been working on these um, for the past years, trying to do this. And I'm going to start showing some of the results. Um, I'm going to start with one, this one. This is GMRIGA. This is a product that has an inner cavity. And these were observations that we obtained with VLA at seven millimeters and also with ALMA 0.9 millimeters. And with these two wavelengths, we tried to model the disk um, to try to estimate uh, the dust surface density and the maximum grain size. Uh, when we did this back in 2018, we used a, uh, a physical model basically to try to estimate these properties. Um, we used the DALIS diet model, the DALIS irradiated decretion disk model. It's a disk model that was developed by Paula D'Alessio at AIDEA there. Um, this model, this uh, model basically is a physical model that uh, uses, assumes a viscous accretion disk. Uh, it irradiates the disk and it computes the vertical um, hydrostatic equilibrium. And with that, you can get the uh, temperature and density structure of the disk. And then you can estimate, you can calculate an image and an SED. So we did this and modeled the full spectral energy distribution of gmr and also the interferometric visibilities, so the observations uh, with BLA and ALMA. And this is the physical model that we got. We saw that even though it's not evident in the image, you need these multiple rings in the disk. Um, and more importantly, we saw that we, we need to have the, a dust trap in these two rings. We need to accumulate particle um, dust particles in these two rings. Uh, two rings. And also the other thing that we found is we found that we needed a maximum grain size of one centimeter. So again, in contradiction with polarization uh, results. And the caveat is that using a physical disk model meant that we needed to uh, make some assumptions. Like for example, we needed to fix the maximum grain size in the disk. The whole disk has a maximum grain size of one centimeter, um, which is not the best, but uh, being a physical model, it would become very computational expensive to try to vary that. Um, and also just one note, um, these are the, this is the model that we got at this time when there were no high resolution observations, but later high resolution observations showed that this disk indeed has this multiple ring morphology, which was pretty nice. Um, but yes, so we had this limitation with this physical model. So after this, we tried a different approach. We tried to use a model that was simpler, but that allowed us more flexibility so that we could model the radial distribution of the disk. Um, so that we can get these variations of maximum grain size and the surface density. And that also, hopefully, we could put this in a more powerful uh, fitting um, algorithm like patient inference uh, algorithm, for example. So this, the idea of this is going back to what I said, that the intensity is a function of the temperature, the surface density, and the opacity. Uh, this function that I'm just labeling F here, um, if you assume that the disk um, is vertically flat, um, and vertically isothermal, which are good approximations when you're spotting the large particles that are in the midplane. Then if you also assume that the disk is completely thin, you get something that is very simple. This is a simple equation. Uh, the intensity is just the dust opacity times the, the um, Planckian at the certain dust temperature and the density. Uh, now, as I said, this is probably not correct. So you could, if you don't assume that it's optically thin, but you will only take the absorption opacity, then you get this equation, which is a bit more complicated, but still easy. The problem is that if the disk is not optically thin, then you cannot neglect scattering. You can you need to take into account the fact that those grains can absorb and also can scatter radiation. So if you do that, uh, then the equation becomes a little bit more complicated. Uh, this is the equation that you would get, uh, but it's still doable. It's a, still an analytical function. Uh, that in fact, it only depends on three parameters. Uh, one parameter that I didn't mention here is this mu, this is just inflammation, which is also known if you resolve this. So uh, as I said, you assume a dust composition, uh, you some, uh, assume a, a, a particle size distribution, that is a power law. This is what's done. It's, this is also what's seen in um, lab experiments. Uh, if you have a popula dust population that is dominated by fragmentation, you will get this kind of power law. Um, particle size distributions. And then in here, I'm actually also letting these slope vary because you can also do that. You can vary the slope of the particle size distribution. You can also vary the maximum grain size. And with these two parameters, you would get a dust opacity, uh, an opacity law, which I'm showing here on the left. The upper panel shows the absorption opacity at 1.3 millimeters versus in the x-axis, the maximum grain size. And then the middle panel shows the albedo and the bottom panel shows the total 
opacity. So total opacity being absorption plus scattering, albedo being scattering divided by total opacity. So you put this into the equation and actually the intensity is a function of temperature, surface density, maximum grain size, slope of a particle size distribution and frequency. So we've been doing this for various disks at this point. Um, in 2018, we did this for AC169042 with observations at, at three alma bands. Then Carlos did it at initial tau with observations also at uh, three alma bands and also VLA. Uh, then I recently did it with, for TW Hydra, high resolution than, than, than the, the other, um, uh, than the one in AC161042. Four alma bands this time. And basically the results that we're getting out of this, uh, these studies are more or the same. We find evidence of millimeter size particles. You need these millimeter uh, size particles to be able to reproduce observations. You've, we find evidence that there's increased surface density in the rings, meaning that these rings are indeed accumulating dust particles. And in some of them, the dust to gas ratio seems to be close to one, meaning that we have conditions to trigger some instability. And also an important result is that we find that when you do this analysis very carefully, very in very detailed, you find that the total dust mass in protoplanetary disk, pro disks is between three and five times higher than if you uh, um, estimated the mass just from the thoughts with the uh, assumptions that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and I put also some other references here that you can also, uh, Anibal also did this, uh, Anibal Sierra recently in one of the MAPS papers. Uh, but basically we're finding this similar conclusions in all of these papers. Um, now, something that I, that I want to stress is the, the importance of scattering, because uh, in this first paper, uh, in AC1, c two, we did not take into account scattering, because that's what everyone was doing at the time. Um, and if you do this, for example, you would find the somewhat surprising result that the optical depth seems to be close to one, but not larger than one. Um, and then actually the same approximation was used in D sharp, a large program, Alma large program of protoplanetary disks. Um, they were making these assumptions, similar assumptions without uh, uh, taking into account scattering and estimating the optical depth. And they were finding that the optical depth in some regions of this seem to be a, a bit higher than one, but it seems to be, it seemed to be close to 0.6. Uh, like it seemed to be like the optical depth was capped at 0.6. Uh, which was suspicious, but there are actually physical reasons to think that this could be possible. For example, if the disk of substructures, these rings, are indeed forming planetesimals when they reach a dust to gas ratio of one, this will mean that if you put a lot of mass into one of these substructures, all of this mass that is above dust to gas ratio of one will go quickly go into planetesimals because it can quickly form uh, trigger stability and form them. And as, as long as soon as you go below this dust gas ratio of one, then you stop forming planetesimals. So you stay there, you stay at that mass. Then you move some dust particles from the outer disk because of radial dip, and you put them into this pressure bump again. You, your mass goes, your bond, uh, dust gas ratio goes above one. You put that mass into planetesimal and you stay at one. So there could be a reason to think that maybe the optical depth is universally 0.6 because universally we find, we form planetesimals. However, as you can imagine, this is not right. If you take into, into account scattering, you find quite different results. This is a plot, for example, from Carlos' uh, paper in HL Tau. The solid line shows the absorption plus scattering, optical depth. The dashed line shows the optical depth only uh, with absorption. And this is plotted in two different wavelengths at alma band 7.9 millimeters, and also with VLA at 8 millimeters versus radius. So you can see that if you only assume absorption, then you will get masses, uh, you will get that the disk is completely optically thin with the VLA, and it's even optically thin beyond 60 AU at alma 0.9 millimeters. But you will, when you take into account scattering, you see that the disk is completely optically thick with alma, and it's even optically thick at VLA in the inner regions. Uh, again, in TW Hydra, the same thing. If you take into account scattering, you do this properly, you will see that actually at, even at three millimeters with alma, the disk is optically Thick. It's optically thick, completely optically thick in the inner 20 AUs, and it's optically thick also in the rings in the outer disk. So, this is one important conclusion that we're finding in all of these uh, studies also is that the disks are optically thick at three millimeters. So, this is, uh, this, this is important because this means that 
if the discrete optically thick, we cannot properly constrain the mass because of this high optical depth will be hiding, will be hiding a lot of the mass in this. So we need to go to longer wavelengths. We need to go to longer wavelengths to be able to trace optically thinner emission and be able to measure the full uh, dust mass of this. So the only uh, observatory that can do that right now is the VLA. And so that's why we have currently this uh, VLA large program that is called V-Sharks. VLA is probably at high angular resolution of these substructures. Um, that Carlos and I are working on it. Uh, for now, we have 180 hours located more or less on two sources, GM Oregon, TW Hydra. The goal is to obtain images that are 0.06 executive resolution, so high resolution similar to the one that we can get with ALMA, but at nine millimeters. And then we're also getting additional data at other bands to be able to subtract the free emission. Uh, and the scientific goals are to estimate the dust mass, the density and the particle size distribution of these substructures, the way I was telling you. Uh, use this information to analyze the origin of these substructures and also the role that they play in planet formation. And also, since we're gonna be tracing optically thinner emission, we are gonna be able to see if the high optical beds are actually hiding some additional substructures, right? Right now with AMA, most disks appear to be very axisymmetric, which is also a bit surprising from the theory point of view. Um, so with observation the longer with us, we might see if there are finer asymmetries hidden in these disks. And also a secondary goal is to actually study the ionized gas traced by this preview emission and study also this for evaporation. So the, the status right now is that we have basically completed observations of one of the disks, the and uh, the observations for the other disk will take some, still take some time. Um, but the data reduction of the GMRI we're starting now. And this is a preliminary image only with 50% of the data. And this is just data right out of the pipeline. But we can see that on the left is the ALMA image, on the right is the yellow image. We can see that we're recovering the double ring morphology very well. Uh, so once we have all the 100% data and uh, we have a proper reduction um, done carefully. I think we will improve this image a lot. So um, uh, stay tuned for that. Um, another point that I want to emphasize also is the importance of, of this ionized gas. Uh, this is going to be a secondary uh, goal of, of this VLA large program of B-Sharts, which is actually very interesting because uh, with this uh, pre, pre emission, you can trace the ionized gas, and which can trace either a radio jet or also a photo ionized wind. And this photo ionized wind is, is uh, very interesting because it can trace, uh, it can tell you a lot of information about how the gas in front of planetary disks disperses. So by observing, for example, this is a paper that we did in 2016, we observed GMO Riga, but lower resolution at uh, three centimeters. And in contrast here, I'm showing the free free emission, which we saw that we could resolve in actually this double uh, uh, um, directions like one direction on the, the same morphology at the disk and then another um, emission the component that was perpendicular to this so the one perpendicular we attributed to a Brady jet but the one on the same uh, direction as the disk uh, we attributed to a photo ionized one so with this we could constrain the amount of high energy radiation in pinging on the disk which is then a very important ingredient for these photo operation models that, that can tell us how this 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 disperse um, so with the with the large program, we'll have new observations that will improve actually this same disk with better sensitivity, better angular resolution. So this will also be a very interesting result, I think. So I'm 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 telling about this VLA large program that we need 200 hours just to do two protoplanetary disks. Uh, is is there nothing else that we can do? Are these too optically thick with AMA? Uh, well, the answer is hopefully no. So um, hopefully you can exchange quality for quantity. And so this is, for example, something that we're exploring. Uh, this is a project actually by Carlos. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but we're exploring this with a lower resolution survey with a VLA at seven millimeters. Uh, then we can do more, more disks, not resolving everything, but hopefully we can still get a lot of useful information. And we can also, comparing the disk sizes with Alma and VLA, we can get interesting results about radial diff, estimating the maximum grain size. Um, the PI of this project is Carlos, Karina, Malco is right now working on, on the analysis of the first the data. These are not the real observations. These are the ALMA observations and the disks that are, have these green squares are the ones that we have observed with VLA. And another approach, this quantity versus quality, uh, is um, to, instead of focusing on just ALMA observations, trying to model the full specular energy distribution of the disks, 
because that in principle should have more information. Uh, and for that, you can use a, a physical model like the one I was explaining in the beginning, um, diet, uh, the mo physical model developed by Paola D'Alessio. The problem with this is that if you want to do this in large samples, that you can do this because you will, we have a series of huge samples of product like this. But if you want to do this in, in these large samples, the problem then becomes the computing time. This physical model takes about one and a half hours to run. So you cannot do this in a proper, uh, proper statistical analysis for this huge sample of disks. So uh, something that we did to try to solve this issue, and this was mostly done by Alvaro Rivas, who were both postdocs in Boston University, is to train a neural network, an artificial neural network, uh, with tens of thousands of models uh, that you run. And then you train this artificial neural network to, based on the input parameters, provide you an SD. So he did that with, I think, 70,000 models that we ran in the cluster there. Uh, he, he was able to train this neural network with up to a precision of about 5%, which is less than the usual error bars that we have for photometry. So that's great. And then you, you go from having to wait one and a half hours to run this model to just wait microseconds. So then you can put these into an MCMC, for example, and do this in a very robust statistical analysis. And you can do this for a huge sample of disks and you can get things like this. This is a, this is a, a plot of um, analysis of only 23 disks in TORS, uh, but this is the dust, the dust mass in these disks. Um, and this is the history of the disease. So you can do this with huge samples. So this is what we did in 2020. This was the first paper where we presented the neural network. And now another, oh yeah, the, the main result at, at that time was that dots masses were indeed higher because with this physical model, you can take into account the fact that the disk might be optically thick and might be hitting a lot of mass and you're gonna be doing a proper uh, computing of the vertical disk structure and so on. So we were finding masses that were about three times higher but now uh, another graduate student at Boston University, uh, well, actually she's, she just defended her PhD, uh, but sadly she went into uh, the industry, data science. Uh, but she basically extended this analysis to um, uh, 325 disks in 10 different star forming regions. Uh, so a huge effort, um, but she was able to find consistent results that also disks masses are higher when you do this in a more accurate way. If we find masses that are between 1.5 and high five times uh, higher. And interestingly, we, uh, which also makes sense, we find more discrepancy for higher masses because higher this mass, higher this, uh, more massive disks will be more optically thick. So the discrepancy that you get when you assume that the disks are optically thin is higher. Now the question is whether this is enough. Uh, so the more recent papers that have been comparing disks masses with exoplanet masses are saying that the masses in disks seem to be around 100% of the masses in exoplanetary systems. Meaning that it's not impossible, but you need a fine information efficiency. So you need to, basically you need to put all the mass that you have in the disk into planets, which is very hard. It's probably not realistic. So with these results, um, either with these uh, physical disk models or with the multi wavelength models that, that we've been using, uh, doing high resolution, uh, with these factors three, five, uh, you will go to uh, planet formation efficiencies of 30%, 20%. Is that enough? Well, we, we don't know because that, that's a theory problem. That the theoreticians then need to tell us what's the planet formation efficiency that they need. And it's still not clear because it's still, uh, yeah, there are many things that we still don't know. And so it's still not fully clear if 20, 30% is enough. I was talking to a theoretician one day and he told me that he wanted 10%. So, can we get to 10%? Well, maybe. Uh, so one way, for example, is taking into account porosity. So all of this uh, analysis that we've been doing are assuming compact uh, grains. Uh, I'm working now in a paper uh, trying to explore whether, first, whether we can constrain the porosity of the grains and also what would, be, what would happen if we let the grains be porous. And what I'm finding is that the ma dust mass could increase up to a factor of 10. Um, with respect of porosity zero. Porosity is zero, zero already has a factor of three, five higher than these uh, flux space masses. Uh, so, I mean, this 10 is a bit uh, excessive because this 10 would imply porosities of 90%, which is probably not realistic, but we can get another factor here. So 
I think we can get to this 10% of, of my information efficiency. Uh, we just need uh, to do this in a more accurate way. Um, and then another open challenge will be reconcile this polarization grain size measurements with the multiple plane size measure, measurements that we're getting. Uh, right now, they're still not agree. They just don't still agree with each other. Uh, so combining both is probably the next step is necessary, but it's actually very expensive to do this because it, it requires a lot of competition, computing time. Um, recent papers have been suggest and have suggested that dust settling could alleviate the tension if you have, because you have the larger grains more accumulated, but you, you have the, your uh, optical, um, optical depth equals one surface higher up, so you don't see the large grains. And that's why the polarization observations can, can be different. And also another op other options that we are exploring is uh, that grains are not uh, spherical. They are large, but they're not spherical. And uh, they have uh, different um, shapes. And so if you take that into account, then you might also solve this problem. This is something that, again, uh, we're working, uh, mostly Carlos and Daniel Aguirre that was there recently. Uh, we're working on this and hopefully we'll have some results soon. Um, so just going to my summary now. Um, so uh, I hope I've convinced you that, that these substructures appear to have the conditions to trigger uh, the formation of planetesimals via stimuli instability. But one important concern is that these are optically thick at alma wavelengths. So we want to do this better, we need to go to longer wavelengths. Um, the dust masses from demographic studies seem to be underestimated, even maybe up to a factor of 10. Um, but still, the inner tens of the use are inaccessible only with them. So we need to go to these uh, longer wavelengths with VLA. And uh, hopefully, this VSHARTS last uh, proposal program will help us shed a lot of light on this. Uh, and now I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Enrique. Thanks a lot. So let's start with questions in the auditorium. Do we have any questions here? Yes, we do. Hello, Enrique. Uh, can you show the slide number four, please? Yes. The video? Yes. Uh, one could expect that uh, the size of the grains uh, decreases with the, in, sorry, increases with the distance. Why this is opposite to this, uh, this plot? So you mean why the grain size decreases with this radius? Yes. Uh, yeah, so there, there, I think there's um, two things there. One is uh, just dynamical time scales. Uh, in the inner disk, things happen faster because the dynamical time is uh, lower. And also you have higher densities. I think that higher, that higher densities allow you to uh, have uh, more collisions and, and reach high, larger sizes. And I think that's why the fragmentation barrier is a bit higher there. Okay, and the, the radiation of the star, does it play a role in the, in the size or not? Um, let me think. So yes, in some ways, um, for example, in one way, um, I didn't touch on this a lot, but snow, as I mentioned that, um, this freezing and sublimation of volatiles on the surface of the grains can alter the sticking properties of the grains. Uh, th in principle, this is believed to, to be the case, and this is to be it's believed that, uh, for example, Jupiter formed uh, beyond what we call snowland, which is the distance at which the water could be um, in ices in the floor, well, the source is in the protoplanetary disk. Um, because at, after that distance, you have all the water in ice, so you have first, more solid mass, and second, also the grains in principle are supposed to be more sticky when they're surrounded by ice. They can, when you, they collide, they can uh, aggregate uh, more easily. So past the snow line, you get higher um, chances of forming planets and uh, more, uh, more efficient dust growth. And where this uh, snow line is located will depend on, on the radiation of the, of the star. So, um, Warmer stars, more uh, brighter stars, and more and warmer, they will tend to have this snow line farther out. Um, so, for example, you cannot form, in principle, you cannot form giant planets um, in 
herbic stars or intermediate mass stars, you cannot form them at 10 AUs, for example, because the disk is too hot. You could not form them at least via streaming instability. So formation scenarios there have to be different, like gravitational instability, for example. Other ways in which the stellar radiation could affect this is, um, for example, also changing the ionization fraction of the disk. Uh, if you change changes in the ionization fraction will result in changes in turbulence, in MRI turbulence. And that can also change the pressure distribution in disk. You can allow the formation of pressure bumps, which can then form uh, larger grains and so on. Um, and then I think in principle, you, you could also affect, um, the ionization fraction could also affect how efficient the sticking of the grains is. And this is something that hasn't been explored a lot. Because it's complicated, you need to yeah you need to model the uh, dipole of the dust grains and see how that affects the, the sticking properties and that's complicated. But I think in principle that could also affect. Thank you very much. Do you have Aina? Hi Enrique, very nice talk. Hi. Thanks. Uh, in the slide of where you show the DMR of uh, VLA data. This one? Uh, this one? Yes. So um, the ring at nine millimeters is like, it has lots of, of structure. Do you, what's the origin of this structure? Do you think could be related to a planet or something? So the, the origin, I don't know, but indeed, I mean, indeed it is uh, this inner ring, it looks very clumpy in the VLA image. Some of this is noise, but some of it, some of it is real. Uh, we, and I, we did see it in my 2018 paper. This is much lower sensitivity, this is with VLA at 10 millimeters, much lower sensitivity, but you could already see that this side of the disc was brighter. And also with Alma, this, this side of the disc is brighter. Um, it's actually easier to see that in low resolution than in high resolution. Um, so this asymmetry is indeed real. And I do believe that this disk is uh, substructure, has some substructure in it. In particular, it has a bright clump here um, that is hidden in the ALMA observations because of the high optical depth. Now, the origin, I still, I don't know. Um, something very similar was also seen in HL Tau in Carlos' paper, where the VLA observations have uh, actually, it's gonna be seen. Uh, no, I don't have that plot, but maybe you can more or less see it here. There's a clump there. Um, and Carlos proposed that maybe there, uh, in this ring, there, some planet was forming in this ring because the material was accumulating there. And maybe this was sort of the beginning of the clump of this planet. Something similar could be happening in Giamariga, but uh, right, right now I don't have an answer for that. Hopefully when we get all the data and we can uh, do the data reduction properly and the imaging properly, and we have a robust, uh, image that shows the asymmetry, we can then start exploring uh, formation or yeah, different origins for this. Uh, can I say something? There is also another one the, from your paper of HD oh, yeah. and six, uh, where yeah, you I forgot, to, I forgot uh, about my own papers. Yeah. LA, we didn't be, we, we were not very sure it was real, but it was confirmed uh, uh, later by uh, Alma. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's real there as well. Um, I don't have the image here, the VLA image, uh, but the Alma High Resolution image is this one that I have in the, in the, in the first slide. Um, so this, uh, we observed this with VLA as well, and we also saw a clump here, which you do see with Alma here as well. In this case, you do see that the inner ring with Alma uh, is very clumpy. These are, this observation here is at 1.3 millimeters, and this is at three millimeters. This is a observation that I have got and I haven't published yet, but I should. Do we have another question here? Uh, can I ask one question? No. Yes. Uh, when you talk about the cartoon of the this, this classical idea we've been hearing for decades, uh, one of the drawings with the star and the disc, the, that one. Okay. So how can, how can you explain whenever you have the this uh, rings instead of a whole uh, disk? How is the dust distributed? Also, it is also the 
larger grains are in the inner rings and the smaller. So how is that? Yeah, so if you, yeah, if, if you have, uh, I mean, we, we see substructures. If you have substructures, that will affect how the dust grains is distributed across the disk. Um, there are ways of forming uh, these substructures that do not involve um, pressure bumps and trapping particles. These dust traps are gas pressure bumps that I mentioned here. Um, but those seem to be not that. If you, if you look at these, uh, if you look at it, uh, it looks like the most likely scenario is that all of these substructures are caused by some kind of gas pressure substructure where you have, uh, your gas distribution is not smooth, like we always assumed a long time ago, uh, but has different bumps uh, because of some reasons, I, I'll go into that. Um, and then in these peaks of pressure, it's where you can trap large particles. So you would be, these large particles instead of being in a smooth mid plane, they would be located at different rings. For example, if you have rings, uh, accumulating different rings. Um, now the origin of these gas pressure bumps, it's also, uh, debatable. Um, of course, one scenario is, is planets. You have a planet that is forming in the disk and it opens a gap um, in the disk and it creates these rings. Uh, that's the most popular one because also the, yeah, it's the sexiest one. Um, but uh, in fact, it's probably unrealistic to assume that all of these substructures that we're seeing are caused by planets because uh, for example, in these disks, like this, like this one that have these, uh, we're talking here about these gaps and rings. These are hundreds of AUs, and we don't expect so many planets to be formed so far away from from the star. And also, we are seeing a lot of substructures in even in very young disks where, yeah, maybe we could form some planets, but we don't expect all of them to have planets at this age. So. Um, I think the most likely scenario is that some of these substructures are formed by planets, but we have we must have other physical mechanisms that do form substructures as well. Um, and there are various options. For example, um, you can have MH magnetohydrodynamical um, winds um, that are driven by, my, uh, yeah, by the magneto interaction between hydrodynamics and, and magnetic field in the disk. And you have these winds that arise from the surface of the disk. And if you have just a tiny bump, then this bump will grow deeper and you have a, you'll form a ring and a gap. Uh, you can have also substructures because of snow lines, as I was mentioning, if you have a snow line uh, where ice has start to uh, freeze on the volatiles sort of freeze on the dust space of the grains that change the properties of the grains, you can have uh, larger particles. Um, and you can have also gravitational instability. If the disk becomes gravitationally unstable, you can have, for example, spiral arms. Uh, this, for example, the scenario that's been proposed for this, this guy here, I has something. Uh, it's, it seems to be gravitationally unstable and that's what uh, seems to be formed with these spiral arms. So you can have many ways of forming these substructures. The most promising ones, I think, are planets. A lot of these must be planets, but also I think uh, Things that are more universal than planets need to be happening, like for example, MHC effects. We don't have any questions here at the auditorium. Okay, thanks, Jesus. Uh, do we have any questions on the uh, Zoom? Uh, let's see some hands. I don't see your hands. Yes, uh, I did have a question, but I was uh, trying to be polite and wait for others. Uh, okay, well, if no one else is raising their hands. Um, I had a question about, well, a comment about uh, slide 11, where you talked about um, the fact that there could be other effects that you're not, yeah, so this expression and this plot, um, mm -hmm. you admitted, and I li like that the, the, this was this was an admission coming from someone who knows what's going on, uh, that, you know, the, the opacity, there's many other things can affect the opacity, which are not yet included in this. Uh, one of those uh, I wanted to mention was this paper by Lapo Fanciullo from 2020, which discusses mm -hmm. the fact that if you have laboratory analogs of uh, uh, similar-ish dust, it turns out that the low temperature opacities are very, very different in the submillimeter mm -hmm. and the radio. And that can actually uh, increase your dust mass estimates by up to a factor of 20. Wow. Um, and, yeah, and in addition to, uh, since you mentioned porosity as well as one of the things that you could investigate, um, yeah, because the 
typical way of uh, this way of estimating the dust mass assumes a uh, typical value at 160 micron and then extrapolate that and it turns out that the value is just off by you know uh, up to a factor of 20 in at low redshift so that could also yeah. be a solution to this kind of dust budget crisis yeah yes no the dust capacities are there are so many uncertainties right now on the dust composition the particle shape the uh yeah, the temperature, as you said, the temperature is also also will affect it. We we always assume that the dust capacity doesn't change the temperature, but in fact it does change. And if you then take into into account the fact that you might also have ices that correlate on them, they also change. So yeah, um, yeah. So there's a there are huge uncertainties on the dust capacities, uh, and it's sort of the elephant in the room in the field because everyone uses the same values, and but it's completely wrong. <laughs> So um, yeah, yeah, that needs to be done better, but it's complicated. It's really complicated. Uh, spherical grains are really easy to handle. I, I, towards the end of your talk, you mentioned this. Uh, I missed exactly what the ten percent thing was that you were trying to explain. Uh, that is, the theoretician say you want to want to be as low as ten percent. Yeah, so that's that's the planet formation efficiency, which is, I mean, it's uh, just very. It's, it's just defined as the amount of mass that you have in the disk versus the amount of mass that you have in planets. So how much mass in the disk, how much dust mass in the disk would go into forming planets. And so in this, this study in 2018, this study was finding masses that were in the disks that were lower thanks to the XY systems. Later studies that have done this comparison as well have found masses that are more or less similar on the same level, uh, which would mean that the, 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 this problem could be solved, but not so much because you need these hundred percent of uh, planet formation efficient. You, you not you need all the mass in dust particles to go into planets, and that's very unreasonable. We don't expect that. You expect some mass, some dust particles to just fall onto the star. You expect a lot of them to just be dis dispersed away when the disk uh, gets dispersed. But would that problem be resolved if the dust mass estimates ended up being higher than they are? Yeah, if you have if, if the dust masses, well, yes and no. So if the dust masses are a factor of ten higher, meaning that we are a, we are looking at uh, planet formation efficiencies of only 10%, then this problem could probably not be very much. It could be solved. Uh, however, these masses also would also be very high, actually. And uh, it's unclear if we should see, we should be seeing a lot more disks being gravitationally unstable if they were this massive. So that's actually another argument that is used to say that the dust masses that are estimated this way are, cannot be too far from reality. Because if they if they were much higher, then disks could become gravitationally unstable. If you assume some dust to gas mass ratio, because the gas is the, the mass is dominated by the gas. Yeah. And that's a huge uncertainty as well. Um, so um, personally, I think, I think that we are underestimating the masses. But I do think that also planetesimals must be forming very early. And there are other evidence in favor of that. For example, the fact that disks that are only one million year have rings and gaps, and a lot of them are, or some of them are probably formed by planets. So we do find evidence of, of planet formation early. And also in the solar system, the Jupiter was supposed to be formed in one million years, um, which would more or less make sense with these. So, so in the solar system, it was supposed to be a, First generation of planet decimals from that and one million years that form Jupiter and form um, the Kuiper belt, some the cold Kuiper belt, something like that. I forget which one. Um, so there's evidence in the solar system as well that planets form early. So I do think personally that we are underestimating the masses, but I do also think that planet decimals must form very early. Okay. And Thank thus, very efficiency, very efficient. Thanks. Do we have uh, one last question, perhaps, from the Zoom room? Anyone? Okay, if not, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you very much, Rick. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay, thank you, everyone. And we'll see you next week. Bye, everyone. Bye.